served in whatever uh, branch of the service that you were in. Uh, we, we certainly appreciate you and thank God for you. I, I appreciate the freedom we have today of uh, being able to come to this church house and worship the Lord. And that was because of the sacrifices that have been made in the years past to uh, secure the freedom that we have in the United States today. And I'm thankful that you that served and have served in the past, whether it be been during peacetime or during war times, would you please just stand this morning and let us recognize you once again. And uh, boy, we've got what, three, five here. Thank you, thank you, man, for what you have done in the past in, in serving our country. We certainly appreciate that. All right, for uh, Colossians chapter one, I want you to look at verse number nine and down through verse number 14. And I will say before I begin, we are actually looking at preaching from about verses 15 down through verse 23 this morning and uh, preach about the preeminence of Christ. And I was going to just kind of go back in verses 9 through 14 and kind of give you a little bit about what was being said uh, by the Apostle Paul in verses 9 through 14. And as I got to looking at it and looking a little more and a little more and uh, kind of jotting a few things down, I said, man, I'm not going to talk about that and then talk about the preeminence of Christ in verses 15 through 23 because there is a lot about the power of the glorified Christ in verses 9 through 14. So I said, well, I'm going to leave the other alone. I began to jot down a few things and again, didn't put a lot of headings to it. And I thought when I got done, I said a lot of this, that it's the end ought to be in the middle and through the parts that I'm going through. And then I said, no, I'm going to leave it just like I had it. Whether it comes out right, whether it preaches right, that's in the hands of the Lord. So he'll send us what we, we need today uh, anyway. We're going to talk about the power of the glorified Christ. Look with us in verse number nine. Stand if you're able to do so. Paul said, for this cause also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be. Fit. And sometimes, you know, we, we fail to know just exactly how to pray for missionaries and their needs and what their needs are and pray for one another and pray for other folks. Paul lays out here, I think, about nine things. He said, I'm going to pray for you all uh, on your behalf. And here's a good way for you and I to pray for missionaries, pray for one another, and listen to what Paul said. He said, I desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. That's a good thing. Pray for me that I'll be filled with the knowledge of God's will. We all need that. And all wisdom and to have spiritual understanding. Thirdly, that you might walk worthy of the Lord and to all pleasing. I want to walk worthy into the Lord, don't you? I want to please the Lord with my life each day. Then he said, not only that, number four, being fruitful in every good work. Jesus instructs us in John chapter 15 about bringing forth fruit, more fruit, much fruit. We're to be fruitful individuals as children of God. So pray that I might be fruitful. Pray that one another, or each of us might be. And fifthly, and increasing in the knowledge of God. I want to know more about him each day, don't you? And by the Holy Spirit and by the word of God, we can increase in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might, number uh, six, according to his glorious power. Number seven and eight is found in the last part. And of all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father. Hey, we're at the Thanksgiving season. Tammy said this morning, we don't have to wait to thank. I hope we don't wait till Thanksgiving to be thankful. Amen. Man, God's good to me every day. Amen. And the Bible, Timothy wrote and said, there'd be days in these last days, in the perilous times, there would be times when men would become unthankful and unholy. And I've said a lot of times when I've, I've preached out of that passage, when you become unthankful, it won't be long before you'll become unholy. Yeah. And we're living in an age today that people are not thankful for what they have. 
And now we're living in an unholy society. God help us. Giving thanks all unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. Who hath delivered us. Now listen to these next two verses. Here's where we want to look at. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption. How? Through his blood. Even the forgiveness of sin. The power of the glorified Christ. Father, would you help us just for a few minutes this morning. May your name be glorified and honored and praised and lifted up. For all that's accomplished, we'll give you praise and thanks. In Christ's name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. The book of Colossians is relatively a small, it's a short book. It's not very long. It, it, it uh, is a short letter that Paul wrote. In fact, four little chapters here to the church there at Colossians. But it's packed with significant spiritual truth. I mean, as I read through this book, and if you'll just take a little time and read through the book, you'll find that it is packed with spiritual truth through and through. These truths primarily point to the all-sufficient Christ. Aren't you glad he's all sufficient? A careful reading of this book, if you take it and, and step, sit down and just spend some time in it and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart as you read through it and take a careful reading of the book, it'll bring the supremacy of Christ into clear view as you read through the book. And that ought to cause the heart of each believer, you and I that are saved by the grace of God, to respond in worship as he realizes that Christ is all he needs. Those fellow going through some difficult times in life, and we've all wrestled with that. Have we all gone through some difficult times in life? Sometimes not knowing which way to go or which way to turn or what to do next. And boy, it just seemed like that each day brought on new trials and new troubles and new struggles and and things were seemingly getting worse instead of getting better. And he said, one day I, I just didn't know which direction to go. And when he said, I didn't know which way to go, I just looked to the Lord and trusted in the Lord. And he said, I come to the realization that the Lord was all that I had in times like that. And then he said, I come to this realization. He's all I really need. Amen. Isn't that true? When, we're, when we've got our backs against the wall and we don't know which way to turn or what to do next, you realize this. Not only is Christ all there is to turn to and the only one to turn to, but he's the only one you need in the midst of trials. Amen? Amen. So it's my desire that during the next few sermons that we're going to look at out of this book, that each of us will get to know him better. Your relationship with the Lord ought to be growing and it ought to be mature. I remember when Deb and I started dating back in 1975. Boy, that's been a long time ago. I was getting ready to graduate out of high school. Deb was just a sophomore. She's a couple, well, three years, in fact, younger than I am. But, uh, man, I, uh, it, it You know, I didn't know a whole lot about Debbie, and Debbie didn't know a whole lot about me. And I didn't know her likes and her dislikes and what food she liked to eat and what food she didn't like to eat. I didn't know the place she liked to go and the things she didn't like to do. I I didn't realize then that she doesn't like to sit and watch football on Sunday afternoon. In fact, she doesn't like to sit and watch football any time. And she knows very little about it. She... She watched some of the World Series with me this year, and uh, she said, that's the only thing I can really know what they're doing. I can sit and watch it and understand a little bit about what's going on. But you know, over the years, I've, I've grown to, to know what her likes and her dislikes are. I've grown to know what I can say and what I better not say. Because I've realized, you know, there's some things better left unsaid. 
and leave them alone because it'll ignite a little spark if you go there in your conversation. So I've matured, I've grown. Our relationship with one another has grown over the years and I have grown to know Debbie more today after, what, for some 46 years, 44 of marriage and a couple of years before we got married, I know more about her today than I knew about her then. I better know anyway. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Do you know the Lord better today than you did 10 years ago? Do you know the Lord better today than you did 15 years ago? Do you know the Lord better today than you did 20 years ago? If not, there's something wrong with your relationship. We ought to know the Lord better today than we've ever known him in our lifetime. It ought to be a growing and a maturing thing. If it's become stagnant, uh, uh, friend, if it were a marriage, it'd definitely be in trouble. If your relationship with the Lord has become stagnant, you're in trouble. And I've said this a lot of times, and you think about it, what I'm going to make right here. Some folks say, well, I'm just on neutral ground right now. I'm really not moving up, and I'm not dropping back. I've just not grown any in the Lord, but I've not fallen back. I have a tendency to disagree with that. You're either moving up, you're getting closer, or you're finding yourself drifting away and getting farther away from the Lord. Mm -hmm. So we ought to be growing and maturing in the Lord. Paul said in Philippians 3.10, that I might know him, that I might know Christ, that I might know more about God and his son. And I hope that each of us will have that same prayer this morning. Lord, I desire to know more about, hey, listen, folks, I'm going to spend an eternity with him. I want to know as much about him down here as I possibly can. And by knowing more about him signifies that I'm growing in the Lord. Now, I've got two little short things that I want to share with you, and they're neither one of them very long. But man, they're just loaded with spiritual truths. What the Lord's done for us and what the Lord wants to do for you. I'm not going to spend much time on what the Lord wants to do for you. Most of my time is going to be spent on what the Lord's already done for us. First, Paul said, he's redeemed us. There are actually three Greek words translated redeemed in the New Testament. We're going to look at a couple of them. Two of the definitions of the word redeemed translated out of the Greek means this. One means to go into the marketplace to buy a captive. You bought back somebody that has been in captivity. Another means to set free or to let go after that it has been bought. That's redeemed. Now you listen to what it says. We were captives to sin, but the Lord bought us. We were set free. We were let go because when he bought us and brought us out of sin, he set us free. And the Bible said what the Son has set free is free indeed. Amen. I'm no longer a captive to sin. I'm no longer held under bondage in the grip of sin because my Redeemer has set me free. Amen. He delivered me. So in order to redeem something, you had to be able to pay the redemption price. If you went to the auction block and somebody was auctioned off, and you wanted to buy them back, redeem them, buy them back from captivity, you had to have the price that was demanded. You had to have the money to pay to redeem that individual. Listen, folks, our Savior paid the price. Amen. He had what God the Father required. He had sinless perfection. He was a lamb without spot and without blemish. And the price that God demanded from heaven was a sin sinless, spotless lamb. And Jesus Christ was able to pay the price. Amen. He redeemed us. He bought us. He paid for us. Titus 2.14 says he gave himself for us that he might redeem us. Woo! Amen. <laughs> redeemed. Fanny Crosby, you ever look at a lot of Fanny Crosby songs? I think Fanny Crosby put it right way. 
Here's what she said. Redeem how I love to proclaim it. Redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem through his infinite mercy, his child, and forever I am. Amen. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child, and forever I am. Amen. Amen. Oh, man, aren't you glad you redeemed? Amen. Aren't you glad you've been set free? By the blood of Calvary's cross, we've been bought, and Jesus paid the price that we could be ransomed and bought back from a life of sin and slavery, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Thank God I'm redeemed today. Amen. Then secondly, Paul said, he's rescued us. Look at verse 13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. He's rescued us from the grip of sin. I don't know if you ever think about this much or not, but folks, when you were in sin, it had a hold of you. It had you in its grip, in its grasp, in its clutch, and you had no power in yourself to get out of it. None whatsoever. And not only that, but he's, Paul said, he's delivered us from the fear of death. Now there's a little about the unknown and leaving out of this world and stepping off into the next because I've never spoke to anybody that crossed over to the other. Now I've, I've talked to some people that's, you know, said they had that out of life experience where they passed from life and, and they walked through that corridor and they were going into heaven and then the Lord brought them back and let them stay. I've, I've, I've seen, I've heard some stories about that. But somebody that actually died and went to the other side, spent days there, and then come back and told me what it was like to cross from this life to the next life, I've never heard anybody tell me that. And the Lord gives us a, 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 an indicator in the Word of God of what's going to happen I'm going to close my eyes in death and I'm going to absent myself from this earthly house and to be absent from this body means I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Plain and simple. But still there's that little bit of crossing over and going that I've not been through yet. Are you... Are you you can get what I'm talking about. Yeah. Now, I know everything's going to be all right. I know that when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to fear that because in the midst of that valley, there is a shadow. What does there have to be to cast a shadow? Light. Or the sun. <laughs> Light, sun. So if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, there must be a light there in the midst of that shadow to walk through it with me. And that light is none other than the Lord. So now everything that's, is going to be all right. But I'm thankful of this, folks. I'm thankful that he took the fear of death out of my life when I come to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I know. I know that if this earthly house were dissolved, I have a building in, he in the heavens that is eternal, that is made by God the Father. Everything's going to be all right. Yeah. So aren't you glad the fear's been taken out? Yeah. And the darkness, the grip, and the fear, and the terror of dark Boy, isn't it a horrible thing? Darkness is not a good thing. You know, it's everything that's bad is related around darkness. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Most of your crimes are committed at night. Seems like bad things happen at night in the dark. How many times you ever lay being sick in the body and said, boy, how I long for this the day. Mm -hmm. Just light. There's something about light that just is so much better than darkness. Aren't you glad that that the life in Christ just pushes out all that darkness. Mm -hmm. all, all that stuff that's, that's not good. And not only that, but he has delivered us from the dominion of the devil. Mm -hmm. 
Amen. devil had his old fork in me, had me going about doing what he wanted me to do, and a lot of times done some things that, well, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say the devil's been ashamed of. He ain't ashamed of nothing. He wants you to, the, 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 as bad as he can get you to be, that's what he's pleased with. But I'm glad he had to pull his grip off of me one day. Because Jesus Christ forgave me my sins. Amen. When I bowed around an old fashioned altar and asked the Lord to forgive me and, to come, and for the Lord to come into my heart, the, the, the old devil that had me wrapped in grave clothes, had me bound, thought he was going to drag me off into a devil's hell. The Lord said, Get, you, get the road dead grave clothes off of him, release him, remove your grip, turn him loose, and let him go. He's no longer yours. He belongs to me now. Amen. Folks, that dominion that Satan had over us was released. We were in a horrible pit. And Jesus reached down and picked us up. And for some, he had to reach way on down there. But aren't you glad God's arm's long enough that he can reach to where you at? Pick you up out of that old pit and set your feet on a solid rock. So we're in that pit and Jesus reached down and picked us up. Put us on the solid foundation. Say, preacher, what's the solid foundation? Jesus Christ. And the Bible said he established us in a new life. And if you've never received Christ, I want to tell you this. He'll rescue you. He'll throw you a lifeline out. All you've got to do is grab a hold of the lifeline. He'll rescue you if you want to be rescued. Then the third thing that's in this, I didn't even jot this down in my notes, but I see it here. Look at the end of verse 14. Even the forgiveness of sins. Doesn't it feel good to be forgiven? Amen. <laughs> you feel like somebody's mad at you. And uh, you say, you know, go to them, you say, uh, a lot of times folks say if I've offended you, and sometimes they don't even need, need to say if they know they've offended them. <laughs> but that's always seemed like to be the words if I have offended you well we offended a righteous and holy God Amen. we transgressed against a righteous and holy God we sinned against a righteous and holy God but when you ask somebody to forgive you and they look you in the eye and say I, I forgive you and I've had people say well I didn't take it that way anyway when I knew good and well they were lying <laughs> they took it that way they might stand and look at me and say, I didn't take it wrong, but they took it wrong. But even in the midst of that, that that's been upon you, on your conscience and been bothering you about how you may have offended someone, and you look at them and say, I, I ask for your forgiveness, and they look you in the eye and say, I forgive you. Doesn't it make you feel better? God didn't have to do it. But he looked at us one day when we asked him to. And we said, God, I, I know I've sinned. I've transgressed against you. Would you forgive me? And God looked us right in the eye and said, I forgive you. I forgive you. Man, the greatest forgiveness that's ever been known to mankind is the forgiveness of an almighty, a righteous God a, a given to a sinful person, a sinful individual to say you're forgiven. There is no greater forgiveness than that right there. Amen. 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 Now look at the other thing. I got it third in my notes, but now it becomes number four. <laughs> he has settled us. Verse 13 continues, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now I'm not fit for heaven. Why, they had a person in here today that's fit for heaven. Not in ourselves. But we've been made fit for heaven because of Jesus Christ. We who were strangers, foreigners, have, by the grace of God, we have been taken and settled into the new kingdom under a new king and in entirely different conditions. Should I say that one again? Yeah. Let me just give you the jest of it. We changed fathers. Amen. We come out from an old life and entered into a new life. Amen. We were in a kingdom that was destruction and hellfire 
And friends, people say, I don't like to hear that hellfire and brimstone. You better get used to hearing some more of it. It needs to be more preached of in this day that we're living in. There is a literal burning hell. People that reject Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, are going there. There's no ifs, ands, and buts to that. Amen. So we need to preach about hell. But I have been delivered from hell, which was going to be my home, and now I've been made fit for the kingdom of glory, which I did not deserve, but by the mercy and the grace of God, I'm going to get to go there. Amen. And you say, well, how can an individual like us that even though we're saved, even though we're born again, we still got the sinful nature about us. How can we go to a place called heaven? Through Jesus Christ. Amen. Through Jesus Christ. Folks, you have been made the righteousness of God in him, in Jesus Christ. The only way we could ever go into the presence of a righteous God is through Jesus Christ. Amen. That's why God the Father, I believe, looks at the individual when they come, and I, I could almost picture this, and I don't don't go home and write this down in your little ledger that this is in concrete, this is the way that it was done, but this is the way I picture it. Will you, will you just let me have just a little space and show you how I picture it? I can almost visualize us coming to God. Because, folks, that's who we come to. We come to God and we approach God and say, God, I, I want you to forgive me my sins. And I can almost picture God the Father looking at his son, Jesus Christ, and saying, do you think we ought to forgive old Eddie Foster of his sins? And I can almost see Jesus Christ the Son looking at God the Father and say, you remember that day? just outside of Jerusalem on a hillside called Golgotha. The place of the skull, the place that's called Calvary, there I hung between heaven and earth and I died for a witty foster. And I, I washed him in the blood that I shed on Calvary's cross that day. I'd almost hear God the Father look at the Son and say, if that's taking place in his life, that he's accepted as family into the family of God. Amen. Folks, that's what happened when you come to the Lord. You weren't worthy, but Jesus Christ and the blood of the cross made you worthy. And you're worthy for heaven because of Jesus, his son, today. Amen. Amen. So he settled us. And uh, we, we're, we've passed, think of this, we passed from death to life. You who were dead in your trespasses and sins, now's their life in you. There's security that comes by being part of the family of God. He redeemed me, he's forgiven me, he rescued me, he settled me. Boy, I tell you, isn't that wonderful? You're redeemed, forgiven, rescued, settled. There's security from being settled in the Lord. Now, you say, preacher, is that what he's done for us that are saved? Yeah. yeah. That's what he's done for us. You say, now, what's he want to do? What's he still want to do? He wants to do the same for you that don't know the Lord. He wants to do the same thing for you that he's done for me. He wants to make you fit for the place called heaven. Yeah. Now, I'm to the conclusion. Can you say amen right there? Amen. I told you this wasn't going to be real long, but I think we've looked at some very vital spiritual things in this portion of Colossians. Now, here's where I thought I would have took my conclusion and put some of it back in my points, but I left it right here, and I think this is fitting for the end. The Colossians feared the unseen forces of darkness. But Paul says that true believers have been transferred from darkness to light. We're no longer walking in darkness. We're walking in the light. He said that we have been transferred from slavery to freedom. I was a slave, a bondage, in bondage to sin, but now I am free 
in Jesus Christ. I've been transferred from guilt to forgiveness. Do you remember the night or the day, the morning, whatever, whenever it was that you bowed down and you called on the name of the Lord? You remember the load that got lifted off of you? You know what that was that lifted? That was the guilt that you were under. The guilt of sin and the transgression against God. That was lifted up. And the guilt's gone. And in place of guilt, I have forgiveness. I have been transferred from the power of Satan to the power of Almighty God. And I like this power that I'm under now a lot better than the power that I was under before. Amen. Because I have come to realize over time that the devil has a lot of power, but he's not all power. Amen. I've realized that there's things that in in under the power of Satan that there's there, there's great force there, don't get me wrong, but I've realized this. The one that lives on the inside of me now is bigger and greater and mightier than the one that I served on the other side. We've been rescued from a rebel kingdom and now we serve in a, serving a rightful king. Yeah. <laughs> An old rebel kingdom out of it. Goodbye. And now I'm serving the rightful king. Verses 12 through 14, Paul lists five benefits that God secured for us when he died on the cross. Number one, he made us fit or meet to be part of his kingdom. You and I who were unworthy have been now become worthy. Secondly, he rescued us from Satan's domination and made us his children. You know what the Bible says about the Gentiles, you and I, we've been grafted in. He put us, you know who the true Israel is now? It's those that are saved by the grace of God, washed in the blood of the Lamb. So we've made his, been made his children. He brought us into his eternal kingdom. I'm not going to, into his eternal kingdom. I'm already there. You say, but preacher, you're in this world. Hey, the day I got saved. I got eternal life. I become part of the eternal kingdom of God. I may still be here right now. You know, Paul said in one passage of scripture, said, man, I've got a desire to part, to part and be with the Lord, but I know that staying here, it's more beneficial for you that I stay here. So God's got a purpose for us here in life and leaving us here. But hey, this ain't home. The day I got saved, my citizenship became that of heaven. And I'm just awaiting the departure. Amen. And I'm going there one day. So he's brought us into his eternal kingdom. Then he bought our freedom or our redemption from sin and judgment. Now I've got to spend a minute right here. I said it's about done. Can I give, will you give me five minutes on this one? Do you believe God's a righteous and holy God? Amen. I do. Do you believe God punishes sin? Amen. I do. And folks say, well, a loving God, well, if he's a righteous and a holy God, he must punish wrong. Right? He's God, so he must. So you and I sin and transgress against a righteous and holy God. So therefore, what does God have to do to you and I? Punish us. We've sinned. So he must punish us. Can I get down there to where you're at in just a minute? I hope that thing will follow me, Stan. Because I want you to get the full gist of this right here. If God must punish wrong and God must punish sin, then what was there for God to do? One of two things. He could punish you and I individually and we could pay our own sin debt and we could spend an eternity separated from God 
or he could punish sin in his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And folks, that's exactly what happened on Calvary. Yep. He didn't die for sins he had committed because he had done none. Amen. So he died for the sins that I had committed. And he died for your sins. And so for, therefore, the judgment that we would have gotten, God levied the judgment on his dear son at Calvary's cross. Amen. That's why the Bible speaks so much in the book of Isaiah about him becoming our substitute, about him dying in our place. What we should have gotten, Jesus took. Amen. The judgment that I deserve has already been rendered out upon Jesus Christ. Amen. So therefore, now listen to this. For me to be tried again for the same crime would be, what do they call it in the legal system today? Double jeopardy? And that's not going to happen. The judgment that I should have gotten, Jesus has already taken. Amen. So my hell that I deserved, he's already endured. Can you say praise the Lord right Amen. there? What I deserve has been taken care of in Jesus Christ. So he bought our freedom, redemption from sin and judgment. And then the last thing that I see in this, he forgave all our sins. Not just a few of them. Folks say, well, you got to come to the Lord and confess all your sins. Good Lord, my goodness. Could you remember them all? I confessed them collectively and said, Lord, I'm a sinner. Would you forgive me of my sins? But I couldn't remember every single one of them. But guess what? He forgave me of every one of them. Amen. Every one of them. Amen. And he didn't care what it was. His blood was big enough and extended far enough that he covered all of my transgressions Amen. and saved me by his marvelous grace. I'm glad I didn't skip over this part. Now we'll look at the preeminence of Christ next Sunday, but I'm glad I didn't pass over this because, boy, there was sure a lot in it, wasn't it? Amen. Aren't you glad you've been bought? by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Aren't you glad your sins are forgiven? Aren't you glad they're cast as far as the east is from the west? There's a north pole and south, but there is no east and west. They're gone. <laughs> they're just gone. They're covered by the blood. They're put in the depths of the sea and never to be remembered again. Thank Amen. God. Amen. My sins are gone. Amen. Redeemed, redeemed. By the blood of the Lamb, Amen. redeemed, and forever I am. Amen. Thank God. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Aren't you glad you saved today? I see a lot of those TV programs on television, a lot of the evangelical shows, and I watch some. There's some I kind of weed through some of their same, but a lot of times they'll say, Look at the person next to you and say, thank God I'm saved. Well, I'm not going to ask you to do that right now. But boy, that'd be fitting right now, wouldn't it? Just say to somebody, thank God I'm saved. Thank God I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You that are listening this morning to the way of Facebook, you're not saved, you can be. I preach to you about what God has done for us that are saved. I didn't get into a whole lot of it, but I want to tell you there's something that God wants to do for you today. He wants to do for you what he's done for me and others in this church house today. If you're here unsaved without Jesus Christ, he wants to do for you what he's done for others. If you'll just let him. I pray that you'll invite Jesus into your heart if you don't know him this morning. Father, right now in Jesus' name, I, I've done my part. I've done the best that I could do under the leadership and direction of the Holy Spirit. 
And I think you've spoken to our heart in a very special way today. And I thank you, Lord, for forgiving me of my sins. I thank you for bringing me out of the darkness into the light. I thank you, Lord, for making me fit for the place called heaven by your son, Jesus Christ. Not in anything that I could do, but it's all in what you've already done. I thank you, Lord, that you took my guilt and you took my judgment and you bore it on Calvary's cross. And now I can be made free and be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Lord, I thank you for all you've done for me. But now, Lord, the good news is you want to do it for somebody else. <laughs> oh, my, you just don't quit wanting to do it. Your blood extends to the very depths, to the uttermost, and as I've often said, to the guttermost. It goes and goes and goes and keeps on going. So, Lord, I pray right now, may somebody, accept what you've done for them at Calvary into their life and become a part of this great kingdom that I'm going to and, and am already a part of this morning. Right now in Jesus' name, touch hearts and we pray and praise you. Amen. Let's sing. made that decision this morning publicly here in this service. You that are listening to my Facebook, you may not have right now bowed. I pray you have if you don't know Christ, but if you haven't done so this morning, you can do so. You can do so even after you listen to this message and after the service. Just call on the name of the Lord. Dee Dee's asked to be anointed this morning, so if you uh, would minister to Deacon, would you come and let's... Uh, Let's do that. Dee Dee's had a very hard time here in the last little while, a lot of sickness and things, and we appreciate her coming and trusting in the Lord this morning. And uh, the book of James reminds us, uh, and I, I've often told people, hey, there's no fire in that little bottle of oil. My gosh, they probably somebody don't have a label on it, went down to the drugstore and picked up that little bottle of oil and you can, any of you can go get you one tomorrow. There's no power in that little bottle of oil. And I come to the realization there's no power in my touch. <laughs> but I, I believe when we come in obedience to what James taught us in the Word of God, any sick among you, let them call the elders of the church. Let them anoint them with oil. And if they committed any sins, their sins will be forgiven them. And they could be healed as well. And I believe that. I, I believe in what the Bible teaches. Folks say, well, that old book's outdated, preacher. Well, then I'm outdated. I'm just outdated because I still believe it uh, It wanted us to do exactly what it said to do. Bob, lead us in prayer, brother. Father, I pray for Dee Dee today. You know her physical needs, and I pray, God, right now that you would minister not through my little touch, not through the old, but by your power and by your precious touch would you move in her life. And Lord, take the, the sickness and the pain in the body, just remove it, take it out, Lord. She trusts in you, I trust in you, and I believe there's still power in the touch of Almighty God today. So move in her life, move in her midst right now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, children. We appreciate you.